Good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody's doing well. Uh, we are finally starting. For those out there uh, on Facebook as well, I, we apologize for the delay. We've been having some technical issues. So uh, we are using my computer this morning. So my computer doesn't have the scriptures that are going to pop up on your screen that they usually do. Um, uh, again, just for, for some technical issues, we've, we've been having some problems this morning. So you're just going to have to follow along. Um, I will try to be as slow as I can, but uh, as fast as I can as well um, to get through this lesson. So let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we, will, uh, we will start um, this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much for your word. And thank you, Lord, uh, for the time, God, that we can gather together and glean from your texts. Um, what you have to say to us regarding uh, not just uh, things, um, how to live and conduct ourselves in the world presently, but also the future as well. And so we, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray, God, that this would be encouraging and instructive to us and that you would be glorified overall. We love you so much for it's in your son's name. Amen. Um, before we start, um, I think it would be beneficial um, for our introduction to chapter six, um, if this if this thing plays, to uh, start off on how how not to do uh, esch eschatological theology. Okay, how don't this is something that you don't you don't want to do. Okay, so let's uh, let's see if this works here. Cross your fingers. It works. That's not how you do this, all right? <laughs> That's not how you do this. Contrary to what people may believe out there, and even our particular culture, um, that's not how you do uh, bibliology. Um, we've uh, we have uh, went through chapters four and five, and we've asked and we've asked some questions concerning four chapters four and five. And as we've asked those questions, we've walked through um, essentially uh, just the text, right? Looking at words and phrases, trying to understand those questions, right? And now we're going to turn our attention to chapter six. We're not necessarily going to answer any questions here. We're just going to walk through the text. Uh, but we are going to highlight along the way, kind of point some things out and highlight some things so that we can gain some understanding about this particular chapter, okay? Um, this particular chapter is kind of hinges on chapters four and five. The procession is still going on, but now there's some things that are happening that are important for us to know and that John writes in details very specifically. Before we get to chapter six, though, of Revelation, I want us to take a slight detour. OK, turn, if you will, to Second Thessalonians. One of the cool things about scripture is that scripture uh, 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 affirms and underscores itself, okay? And especially in terms of future events, these are not things that uh, are, are, are kind of new. They're not, uh, they're, they're amazing, but they're not new. These things have been written about before. And the book of Revelation, again, is a patchwork uh, and an expansion of all the things that have been mentioned previously by the apostles, by the prophets, and all that stuff. 
And in terms of uh, chapter six, I want us to read uh, verses one all the way to, to 12. And we're going to mention some things here. Now, we request of you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you, in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the departure. I know it says apostasy in some, but, but it's, it's departure. Okay? And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who oppresses and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself being as, as being God. Do you not remember while I was with you? I was telling you these things and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, right? with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a, a deluding influence or an activity of error okay? so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth and took pleasure in wickedness. I want us to spend the first couple of minutes on verse seven. Because they don't believe the truth, I'm sorry, verse 11. Because they don't believe the truth, because they do not believe in what God has said, what he has revealed in scripture concerning himself, concerning his son, concerning his works, because they don't believe, God will send upon us, them, them a activity of error or a deluding influence so that they will believe the lie or what is false. This, uh, this verse here is an expansion or, or, or I'm sorry, a, a synopsis of chapter six of Revelation, okay? Let's go ahead and go to chapter six, verses one to six, and let's read it. And then we'll make some, uh, some identifying markers here. Chapter six, verses one to six. says, uh, then I saw the lamb broke one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say, come. And I looked and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Verse three, when he broke the second seal, I heard and the second living creature saying, come. And another, a red horse went out and him who sat on it. And it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. And then when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and look and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of wheat for, like three quarts of barley for denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. There's something to note here. I want to kind of throw an idea at you, and let's kind of think about this as we walk through these texts. All of these things, all of these qualities that John is writing and detailing, the subsequent events that are happening and occurring right now, um, um, before the eyes of John, and he's writing them down, 
is to establish that there is a false kingdom and with a false messiah and a false deliverer. And the consequences the world receives as a result of embracing this conqueror and this kingdom and his unsanctioned rule. This is something that God will send to them, right? This judgment comes straight from Christ. As we read in chapter six, verse one, this is Christ executing these seal judgments on behalf of the father. This is a kingdom that is not sanctioned and yet is happening to show them their wickedness. Let's take a look at a couple of verses to kind of underscore this point, okay? Let's look at Revelation chapter six, verses one to two. Then I saw the lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say, come. And I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out to conquer and conquering and to conquer. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, 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 words here, at least the ones highlighted in red. We'll kind of walk through this. We see the lamb breaking one of the seven seals and one of the four living creatures saying, come. John looks and he our attention is drawn to a particular object, a white horse and he who sat on it, who had a bow and a crown was given to him. Right. And he went out to conquer and to conquer. Hippos Lucas is the term for white horse or horse that is white. This phrase is only used twice in the entire Bible. Okay. You won't find this anywhere else in scripture. Okay. You'll be surprised that the other place that it's found in the book of Revelation is in chapter 19. Let's turn there. Chapter 19, verse 11. This is very curious. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in his righteousness, he judges and wages war. So we have this. A uh, conqueror on a white horse who's coming to conquer and is conquering. And in Revelation 19, we have another coming on the white horse who's known as faithful and true. Very fascinating. We will get back to that in a second. How about the term bow back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, or verse 1 and 2? We have a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. This is taxon, this word uh, uh, bow. Um, this, this is the only time this phrase is used in the entire New Testament, okay? is here in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament is kwesheleth, all right? And we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of examples here of how this phrase is used. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 27. A, very, a, a word that is very similar here to describe a bow. Genesis chapter 27. This is concerning Jacob and Esau, if you remember. Now, now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. 
And he said to him, here I am. Isaac said, behold, now I am old and do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver and your bow, Quesaleth. And go out into the field and hunt game for me and prepare a savory dish that I love and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may be blessed before I die. So we see here in this particular passage here of scripture that this bow is used for hunting game, right? For uh, for killing and for bringing back, right, for uh, Esau to, to uh, hunt his game for his uh, father. And cook it and bring it. First Samuel. Oh, hi. Hello. That was loud. How are you doing? Good to see you. Um, First Samuel. Chapter 31. Verses 1 to 3. First Samuel. Chapter 31. Verses 1 to 3. This is concerning Saul and his sons who were slain. Because this is the close of the end of the book of First Samuel. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the man of Israel fled. Uh, from um, from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan and Abinadab and Malachi, Shua's son, the sons of Saul. Verse 3, the battle went heavily against Saul, and the archers hit him, for he was badly wounded by the archers, those who had bows, right? He was wounded by them. Second Chronicles, chapter 26, verses 13 to Second Chronicles, chapter 26. Concerning Uzziah's victory. Under the direction was an elite army of 307,500 who could wage war with great power to help the king against the enemy. Moreover, Uzziah prepared for all the armies shields, spears, Helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones. In Jerusalem, he made engines of war invented by skillful men on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. So all throughout these examples here, we see that, a, that the bow is used for war. It's used for conquering, right? For killing, for destruction. So this gentleman or this person who's coming will be riding on a white horse and will have a bow. Then we see that he will also have a crown as well that was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Again, this word Stephanos is the term crown. This phrase is used 18 times in the New Testament. And it is used eight times in the book of Revelation itself. Usually a crown uh, would symbolize or, or, or better yet reflect authority. It would reflect power, influence. Okay, Let's take a look at some of the examples uh, found in the book of Revelation itself. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it up just a little bit. If you miss them, if you miss the, the scripture reference, just go ahead and write it down for later reference. This is to, concerning the message of the church of Smyrna. We've read this before. Verse 10. 
Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you may have um, tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Again, that word crown is the word Stephanos. Okay? We talked about this often that those who uh, endure uh, 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 persecution, harsh affliction will be rewarded with the crown of life concerning the church of Smyrna, those various pressures. How about Revelation chapter three, verse 11? Just a chapter over. Same word here. I'm coming to you quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your Stephanos, your crown, concerning the fellowship of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter four, verse four, concerning the elders the around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed with white garments and golden crowns on their heads. We talked about who they are, right? Again, they are given crowns as well. Revelation 4, 10. Again, the talking about the 24 elders, that the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. The activity of worship uh, to the almighty by these 24 elders. Revelation chapter six, uh, verse two, which we we just looked at concerning the one on the white horse and Stephanos was given to him. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. I can't wait till we get here. Oh, man. Talking about the locusts that come up from the abyss. Verse 7. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be Stephanos, crowns like gold, right? We'll talk about them later. We're getting to them very quickly. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Concerning uh, the vision that John sees with the woman clothed, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head were a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child. And she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Is this Mary? We'll talk about that when we get there. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Again, we're just looking at the instances here that occur in the book of Revelation. That again, they refer to authority of some sort or honor of some sort. So we see that this individual who is coming by the way of Jesus breaking the seal is coming on a white horse, has a bow, right? Which is which signifies war and 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 carnage which signifies uh, uh rule and then we have a crown symbolizing a, uh, uh, a re referencing authority and the crown was given to him and he went out to con conquering and to conquer this is interesting this word here is nikeo we've seen this word before as well Nikeo. This word occurs 28 times in the New Testament. We've already we've already seen this word and we talked about it often. Okay? This word occurs 15 times in the book of Revelation. We will not go through all of them. Um, this word is usually translated as overcomer or, or, or conqueror. Okay. In terms of the uh, when it's used of the believer, it's 
It's talked about us being overcomers by what by by what we believe concerning Christ and who he is. In this particular place, in this context, this word is used as one who conquers, one who uh, um, uh, uh, gathers great influence over lands, regions, places. One who seeks to subjugate. So let's take a look at some comparisons here between the conqueror versus the word of God in Revelation 19. We have a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown and went out conquering and to conquer. Whereas we see in Revelation 19 that heaven opens and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. Okay, Notice the uh, the characteristics and the qualities between the two. They are not the same. Okay, One is coming uh, to instill chaos. The other one is coming to end it. One is coming to destroy. The other one is coming to establish. One is coming to conquer for the sake of basically pulverizing the saints. The other one is to come to expound and extend righteousness to the world. A white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown and is conquering and conquering. And he uh, and one who is coming on a white horse and he uh, is faithful and true. And on his crowns and, and, and with many crowns to which he will strike the nations and judge. I want this to be uh, clear. In Revelation chapter 6, we see again the establishment of a false kingdom. Okay? It's one of the reasons why we are not here at this time. Because this is not for us, right? When we, when we appear with Jesus and establish uh, the millennial kingdom along with him, this is not for us this time. This is for the world itself who has decided not to believe in God's word. And this judgment is explicated among the world by bringing exactly what they want. Okay? Again, I, I am I am very uh, it's very interesting to me the details here surrounding this text. Let's take a look at one of uh, the seals of the scroll. So now we have the false rise and installation of a world conqueror. That's cha that's Revelation chapter six verses one to two. That is the first seal. Okay. What about the second seal? Revelation chapter three, uh, chapter, chapter six, verses three and four. It says, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And another, a red horse went out and to him who sat on it and was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. Let's take a look at one particular word here and that's red horse. This is interesting. Uh, this word is hippos piros, right? Uh, uh, ho red, horse of red, essentially. This is translated as a uh, red horse or fiery horse. Okay? And wouldn't you know it, this term piros is uh, only used one other time in the New Testament. It's used twice in the entire New Testament. The first one is here. Where do you suppose the second one is used? Oh, turn with me to Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 3. Revelation 12, verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, 
And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. This is the only time that this word is used here. This word piros, in this context here, And in the one before, it can be associated with the destructive nature of either a person in the form of a red horse or concerning the image associated with the dragon. So this, this conqueror who comes as a white horse may seem like a a great deliverer, but he's bringing destruction and carnage. In his wake, all of these all of these these seals are connected to each other. Okay, they're not independent of each other; they are connected to each other. This conqueror uh, will not bring peace. This conqueror will bring chaos. He will bring destruction on an immense scale, unlike any unlike the world has ever seen. Because of this, people will turn against each other. People will work for him, will work with him to destroy others, as we see in the text in chapter chapter 6. It says, uh, verse 4, and another red horse went out, and to him who sat on it was granted, was granted to take peace from the earth and that men or those would slay one another. Okay? And a great sword was given to him. Peace. This is underscored by this word, arene. The word for peace. It's usually, it can be translated as peace or rest or quietness as well. This word could also be associated with salvation and reconciliation with God, that we have peace with God. The hostility uh, between us and God through Christ is is, is secure, right? I'm sorry, it's over. The hostility is over. It could also be associated with lack of conflict between men as well. So it's not just associated with the relationship that we have between God in Christ, but it also could talk about men as well. If you turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 26, we see this word used in this manner. Acts chapter 6, or Acts chapter 7, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 7, verse 26. It says, on the following day, this is uh, the the account of Stephen, basically laying out the the synopsis of the Old Testament to uh, the rulers before he is executed. Verse 26, on the following day, he appeared to them, and as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, in arena, saying, men, you all are brethren. Why do you injure one another? Right? That was the point. They were destroying one another, and and, uh, they were trying to call them to reconcile for peace. Romans chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. Concerning uh, individuals and their consciences. Verse 16. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as of evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by 
men, right? That, that, that the qualities of the kingdom of God is that of peace and righteousness. And these are the things that believers should endorse amongst each other and the relationships that we have with each other. And then uh, uh, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Last, last verse here. Galatians 5, verse 22. I'll start at verse 20. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, um, which are um, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions. Factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Again, the quality of a person who has an identity in Christ is to be consistent with that of peace. So let's talk about, uh, let's spin, uh, we're not, I'm not gonna finish, man. Let's take a look at one more word here. The word slaying, I'm not talking about slaying as in like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slaying right now. I'm talking about slaying as in dead, right? Cause I know, I know, some, I know some of the old, I see, I, see I, was, I was a young guy once, I did this. I, I, I used to talk. I used to talk cool. Now I don't anymore. My daughter tells me that very well. She rolls my eyes when I say things. OK, so I get it. But we're not talking about that slay. OK, we're talking about uh, Sephardza, which is translated slay or murder. This is the type of slay you don't want. OK, you're not you, you may be looking good in a box. This is our uh, translate. This is used 10 times. In the, in the New Testament. And this word is used eight times in the book of Revelation. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these examples here. Let's run through these real quick. And then I will at least close with uh, to be continued. Revelation chapter five, verse six. This is spoken of, of the lamb. It says, and I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if Sephartha slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Murder. Slain. Okay. Revelation chapter five, verse nine. There's a couple verses down. It says, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, same word here, and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The slaying of this lamb brought about the blood which, uh, was, which purchased men, right? Revelation 13, 13, or 13, 3. Excuse me. Chapter 13, verse 3. This is concerning the, the, the beast from the sea. It says, then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast I saw was um, and the beast I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion, without the mouth of a lion. And the dragon um, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw on one of his heads, as if it had been slain, a fatal wound was healed. Again, notice the language. It says in chapter 6 that a crown was given to him. Who gave him that crown? God didn't give him that crown. Again, this is coming straight from the dragon, Satan, who is the ruler of this world system. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. 
concerning uh, uh, Babylon and the activity that was occurring in Babylon. I'll start at verse 23. And the light of the lamp will not shine in you any longer. That is Babylon. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all those who had been slain on the earth. There's going to be a time of you want to talk about some unrest. It's going to make uh, Antifa look like Girl Scouts. So what do we conclude here? Actually, let's keep let's keep going. I, I still got I still got about 10 minutes. We're just going to have to have a short break, brother. Yeah, yeah you're going to have to do it, man. Yep. Ah, oh, no, I'll, I'll let you have some. How about that? Yeah, I'll let you have some. I'll, I'll be nice to you. So what's the point here? The point is, is that this conqueror who's coming is not a good one. This one who's coming, who's bringing destru destruction and death and carnage to, to everyone, everywhere. There will be no place you can go, no place you can hide to see this play out. And yet this parallels, again, this is a false kingdom that's being established with a false deliverer, a false messiah, a false ruler who will promise peace, but will not, he will not deliver. Will promise justice, but will instead bring disorder, chaos. Who will promise righteousness, but instead bring the most unimaginable unrighteousness you can imagine. This is the man of lawlessness, and this is a judgment on the world, folks. Let's not get this twisted. This man isn't just going to come out of nowhere. This is a judgment on the world for them not believing the truth. So you don't want the truth? This is what you get. And the consequences of how this will play out and extend upon the globe. Okay. This is why it's so important for us as believers in Christ to continue to speak the truth, to continue to uh, 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 remind and proclaim to individuals that grace is given. Even within this particular horrific time, there is much grace given. But that's not, but it's not going to come without a high cost, though because of going through this horrific time with this conqueror who is going to promise all of these wonderful things and yet is going to be one of the most nightmarish, horrific people that has ever uh, stepped foot on the face of the planet. We will end there, finish up next week, and then continue on uh, looking at Revelation chapter 6 um, and following. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, um, this is a very sobering chapter. It is a sobering chapter because it reminds us of a couple of things. It reminds us, Lord, that first of all, your grace is wonderful. That you have given to us this wonderful gift found in Christ. And that we don't have to experience this time that's coming. That you've, you've given us a way out to be saved from this uh, this uh, uh, affliction. But Lord, it also shows God that you don't, you cannot allow uh, this unbelief to go unnoticed. Lord, that uh, you are a, a just God and that, and that uh, those who do not believe, those who are not convinced of your word and who your son is, they will, base, they will face the consequences of that decision. They will embrace a Messiah that is not a Messiah, a deliverer who's not a deliverer, and will, and will cause so much unrest for them. 
We thank you so much, God, for showing us uh, the end game in advance so that we may be uh, grateful of your mercies and of your grace. We love you so much, Lord, and give you due praise for it's in your son's name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.